I'm talking about today about what I love about my practice. Um, and uh, yeah, love about the, the holistic understanding of the work that we do. And it may sound funny, Ayurveda, well, isn't that holistic anyway? What's so special about it? But what, what do we actually mean, holistic? And how do we actually do it? It's easy to say, yeah, well, Ayurveda is a holistic philosophy, science, etc. But well, how do we do that in practice? How do we actually holistically practice this art and science? And what does holistic actually mean? What does holistic actually mean? Obviously, body, mind, and soul, but that's the philosophy of Ayurveda. That's the foundation. That's what everything is built on. But this is about understanding pathogenesis holistically. We're talking about disease. So what about soul in that context? Does the soul get ill? No. So do we need to bother about the soul in a clinical context? No. So where's the holistic, the holistic aspect then? Or how does soul show up in a clinical context in a way that we have to deal with it, that we have to factor it in to really call ourselves holistic? What is the language of the soul? Emotions. Emotions are the language of the soul. How we're we gonna get to that in a minute. So in a clinical context, the trinity Body, mind, and soul turns into body, mind, and emotions. Because these are the three factors that can fall into disarray, that can fall into an imbalance. The soul doesn't. So the question, therefore, is in order to understand the purpose of disease, in order to understand the disease process, and also to understand how to deal, intervene therapeutically, what are the tools that we need? And what do we actually need to? Understand. So we need to understand, first of all, what is body, what is mind, what is emotion individually. And then we need to know how are they working together. Is there a sequence? Is there a science? Is there a logic to the madness that they produce that people come and put in front of us at the, at, on the consultation table? What are the tools that we have in Ayurveda? What are the concepts that we have in Ayurveda to understand body, mind, and emotion? So let's get through that before I get to actual disease examples and just give you a flavor of what I mean by that, understanding patho pathogenesis holistically. The basics. Okay, what, what concepts do we have in Ayurveda to understand the body or the physical situation, balance or imbalance, in a patient? Very simple. You've been hearing it all, all weekend, you've been hearing it all through your training, doshas. These are concepts we use in Ayurveda to have an understanding, an insight, an, an inroad into getting to understand and getting to know what's going on in somebody's body, okay? Doshas, what else? Datus, malas, agni, ama, shrotas, the whole thing, everything we've learned in our studies, these are all lenses that we use. The Chinese use yin and yang lens, okay? They see something totally different through that lens, but it makes sense. So these are lenses that allow us to make sense of what's going on in front of us, okay? <laughs> okay, so I don't need to shout that much, that's great. Okay, so these are lenses that we can use to make sense of what's happening in front of us, so we get an understanding. What are the lenses that we can use on a mind level? Body, mind, emotion. So mind, what are the lenses that you, in your practice, use to understand what's happening on the mental level of a patient, a client, a customer, whatever? The gunas, okay. Sattva Rajasthamas, we mean the Mahagunas. Okay. Great. How many of you work with the gunas in practice? Ah, thank you. So that resonates with my understanding or my practical experience. They are a wonderful tool to philosophically understand what's going on with the mind, but in practice, what are you going to do with three words? What are you going to do with three concepts that basically say only one thing? And I think it was Maria today who beautifully spoke about this. It's like sattva, okay, so this is the balance. And then we have two regulators, if you like. So we have something that down-regulates, tamas, if we're too fast, and then we have something that puts the turbo boost in, if we get a bit too slow. And that's all they really do, rajas and tamas. Just to bring us back opportunities, pathways, to bring us back into balance, into you know, sattva, once we've left the path. But how can you use those if there's not that much more 
that this can give you as a clinical concept to understand what's happening in, body mind, uh, in, in the mind of a patient. And I see when people use those terms, more judgment than understanding. Ah, you know, this, this guy totally rajasic. Oh my, she's so tamasic. There's a lot of judgment in that, rather than the, just a non-judgmental approach to, ah, okay, so this is what's happening. People are being judged, and if, they are, if judgment is allowed to come into concepts like this, what happens? Labeling, putting into categories, putting into boxes, and then you're very close to blaming and very close to shaming. And that's the opposite of what we want to do. You don't want to shame your patients. You know, you need to get, basically, if you say, oh, I think you're a bit classic, basically what you're saying is, you know, you should get your ass off <laughs> you know, on the couch. That's not helpful. It's just not, not even, I'm not talking about communicating this. I'm talking about thinking this. If we as practitioners think this, if we have this in our mind, if these are the only concepts or lenses we have to look at somebody's mind, good luck to you. Your patients are not gonna come. And I would judge, you're not working holistically. You're framing people. That's the opposite of Ayurveda. You're putting people in a box. Everybody says Ayurveda is so fantastic because it's so individual. So how do you understand individually what happens in somebody's mind? Any idea? Any concepts that you can use? I didn't find anything in my formal studies, okay, beyond Satvara Gestalt. And the good advice, well-meaning advice, positive thinking, do meditation, all this. All wonderful tools, but they don't help me to understand my the activities. Okay. So my teacher, our teacher, several of you have met him also, who are in the room. Um, okay, so these are tools we have. We agree on all of those pathways. They are really useful to understand what's going on in the body. Satvarajas Tamas. Okay, but then two other things. Mulya and Manyata. Ever heard of those? No. Okay, Mulya. What are Mulya? Mulya are values. Values meaning good and bad. Those dual values. Good and bad. Like the, like the uh, 20 gunas. Okay, hot and cold. But on a mental level, why is this important in a, in, a, in a context of the mind? Because this is what the mind does. The mind can only judge. That's the, that's the mechanics. That's not, that's not judgmental. It judges non-judgmentally. It just says, that's okay, that's not okay. That's me, that's not me. That's authentic, that's inauthentic. That's light, that's dark. And it is like a, a feedback that helps us to know where we are. That's all it does. That's what our mind does all the time. You cannot stop it. There's nothing wrong with the mind judging. It's the, it's the mechanics, that's all. But understanding how somebody judges and what judgments somebody makes, that gives you an individual insight into what is this person's mind doing? And how do we find that out? Any idea? How do we find out how somebody's mind judges? Listen. Just listen. We constantly announce our values, what we believe in that's right and wrong, that's high or low, with every word we say, all the time. So it's a skill, it's an art that we need to develop, and I don't believe that's just for Ayurvedic people, that's for anyone. And I would say it's not even in the professional field only. It would be really useful to have that anywhere, wherever you relate to anyone out there, even with yourself, to learn that language to listen to how you speak about yourself, how you speak about others, how people speak and what they actually say, to understand ah, this is how they announce themselves and who they are or who they believe they are, who they judge they are in this world. It's beautiful. When, once, you, once you train your sensitivity to hear this, oh my God, you really understand how people tick, what makes people think. And then you get a better insight into, okay, now I understand how you produce this problem in your life. Because when you approach it like that, these will be the consequences. Ah, suddenly things make sense. And that's highly individual and personal. And that's not just abstract stuff that I just tell No, that's with this particular person. Many people may hold that same belief or that same value, but this person has used those value sets and created reality out. Great, you have a fantastic tool, fantastic insight. What are manyata? Assumptions. Sanskrit word is assumption. 
Um, that's true. Assumptions based on mulya, but the word that resonates perhaps more is beliefs, belief systems. Okay, what are belief systems? They are generalized values. Okay? Somebody, a Polish man has stolen my bag. Okay? That's a fact. I may judge that because a Polish man has stolen my bag. That's a value judgment I make. But then for me to say, you know what, Polish people or thieves. That's a belief system. So I generalize the based on an experience I had and a value judgment I made of my experience. I made a generalized statement about a group of people or a person or myself. Belief systems are you know, generalized, vague statements based on uh, um, values that I've made, judgments that I've made. And why is this important? Because all behavior comes from beliefs. That's not just Ayurveda saying. It was the Buddha who said it, all things come from thoughts. Okay, so this, this microphone, okay, that was a thought at some point in somebody's mind. And then it materialized somehow. There were many steps in between. But that's the pathway. Anything is a thought, is energetic at the beginning. And then enough focus is being created to make it denser and denser, and eventually it materializes. And in the same way, behavior, not just things, behavior too. All our behavior is based on beliefs, which is why our present prison system doesn't work. Because it tries to correct behavior, not understanding that it comes from beliefs, and this comes from judgments, and the judgments come from experiences. And if I don't go back all the way, I'm never going to change the people who have unfortunately ended up, you know, committed crimes and then ended up in prison. We're just going to teach them to do it all over again because we're never going to the root cause, so it's not holistic. So understanding how somebody judges or how somebody's mind judges and understanding what beliefs that person has adopted. Dr. Ram Manohar so said that so beautifully uh, yesterday when he said, you know, you nail, you, you nail a particular belief and then you don't even question it anymore. There's no more doubt. You just believe it and you go forward with it. And that's how you create your life. You don't check it. You don't ever question it again. It's just like, yeah, that's right. And maybe it was right at the time, but maybe the conditions have changed. Maybe things around you have changed. Maybe things inside of you have changed. And maybe that belief, although it was useful at some point, isn't quite serving you or helping you to express yourself authentically. So it's useful to check one's belief systems now and then. The problems arise, and for, patho for pathology or pathogenesis, important to understand is that belief systems themselves are not an issue because belief systems have their place. Again, that's how the mind operates. That, that's how it helps us navigate this life. But important is to understand, are they useful? Are they expressions of who I am here and now? And are there contradictory belief systems that I'm holding? Okay, I want to do it all on my own, number one. And number two, oh, I'd love to have a partner on my side. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> And then people come to us and say, you know, I don't know, I, I, I just love, you know, to have this relationship, this partnership, and I don't know, I've always ended up, you know, having short-term relationships, etc., etc., etc. So it might be useful to understand, okay, so what beliefs are you holding? And not to judge people for holding the beliefs, but finding out what triggered them to adopt those beliefs. Because I don't think that people are born with beliefs. They pick them up. And we always think that our values are very solid. You know, our values are core values, you know, the British core values and blah, blah, blah. All of this nonsense for any, any group of people or individual. We keep changing our values all the time. Every day something new comes in. Oh, we make an adjustment. But often the belief systems underline. They are not changing. And suddenly there's this mass, there's this knot of conflicting, contradicting beliefs and values. So having an insight into this, getting into an understanding of the complexity of this and how to assess this, how to access, how to assess this, how to hear this as people speak, it requires us to listen. That's an amazing skill for not only understanding holistically in practice, but also to practice holistically. Okay, so what about emotions? Ha ha, what do we do there? What are the Ayurvedic concepts, lenses, tools that you have to understand emotions? The first word in Ashtanga Hidayam is Raga. Raga, etc., etc., etc. So it's about the physician who is not capable of understanding emotions and all their impacts in a pathological sense will not be able to treat disease. That's how Ashtanga Hedayam starts. 
And then there are no concepts, as far as I'm aware, to understanding emotions. Often emotions are brushed aside or labeled bad. You know, negative emotions, they need to be meditated away or some, some, something is wrong with them. It's not okay to feel fear, it's not okay to be angry, raga. But Ashtanga Hedam says it in the first line, raga. There's a point why this is important to feel anger and all the others, adi, all the other emotions. So what are the tools? How do we understand somebody emotionally? And I'll just judge them. I'll judge their emotions. When can emotions appear? There's only one context in which we actually feel an emotion, in an experience, when we have an experience. And the only possibility for us to have an experience is when we relate. We have to relate to something, either internally, Sasha's part has to relate to another part of Sasha in order to experience something and therefore have an emotion. Or Sasha relates to something or someone out there in order to have a relationship of sorts in a momentary way to have an experience which then triggers an emotion. That's the only way we can feel something. We need to relate. So if you understand how someone relates to themselves and relates to the world around them, how they see themselves in their world, you have a very good understanding how they are on an emotional level big field. We could talk days about this. Okay, but just giving you the basics. Again, emotions, I've learned a lot of this about this from my teacher. He was an Ayurvedic teacher, an Ayurvedic guru, although he never, he always told me never to call him guru. Uh, but it's not in the Ayurvedic textbooks that I studied at university. It's, this is all practical knowledge that I got from my lineage, from my line. Okay, but it's core Ayurvedic. And it's sad, I think, that in Ashtanga Hirdayam and Sushruta's work and uh, Charaka's work, this is not explicitly described as an entity in itself, distinct from this, because I believe this is distinct, as a usefulness in drawing a line here. Why? I'm getting to that in a moment. Um, so understanding, having different tools to access these, is really useful, number one. But then it's also useful to understand how are they connected? How do they actually work together in a pathological context? What, how is disease created among those? Because most people come to us with diseases or with illness or an imbalance on that level, okay, primarily. By the time something has happened, the body is already going, oh, I can't quite do that anymore. And that's what they come with and say, oh, and by the way, I'm also feeling this, and I'm thinking this, and there's a mess, and no focus, and no concentration, etc., etc. But usually they come with something physical. So how to understand how they work together? Okay. In the context of disease, so what's the purpose of disease was the title of the talk. In order to understand, or in order to answer that question, it's important to understand what's the purpose of health. And that leads us to what actually is the purpose of life. Why are we doing this? It's always said, you know, we, we, we should be liberated. You know, the, the aim is liberation, moksha. That's the goal of Ayurveda. Moksha and then, you know, merging back with the oneness and the universe and God or how, whatever you want to call it. Great, but if that's the ultimate goal, why the heck do we do this? Why don't we take a body? Why don't we just stay up, up there or down there or wherever it is and just enjoy the oneness if that's all we are? So where's the method to the madness? Where's the logic? Why are we doing this? What's the benefit? Okay, let's step one, let's go one step back. We all agree in Ayurveda that there's oneness. There's something like we are all one. It's been referred to several times this weekend. The oneness of consciousness, the oneness of God, of nature, whatever you want to call it. So there's the level of unity where we are all one. Where all that exists is one and one only. Which means it's an entity. Okay? So as the entity, one, God, universe, nature, we know who we are. We have a full understanding, intellectually if you like, what we are, who we are, great. But what is the one thing we cannot do as one? We cannot 
experience ourselves. Why? Because, as I said before, in order to experience yourself, you need to be able to relate to something. And if there's only one, there's nothing to relate to. Baka. So now we know we are God, but we can't experience ourselves as God. That's my definition for depression. And whatever clinical differential diagnosis you want to apply to the depression, the, 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 the bottom line experience for anyone who's clinically depressed is, I know who I am, but I cannot experience myself out there as that. And that is so deeply frustrating. That is so deeply draining because it addresses the core issue of identity. I want to experience myself. I want to have a self-experience out there in life of myself. And if that is not possible, you literally go mad. So as God, as one, we go slightly mad if we can't experience ourselves. So we've come up with this amazing idea. Because an entity, as quantum physics tells us today, or scientifically has proven, an entity is always what? Consisting of all that is and plus all that is not. An entity is all that exists plus everything that it is not included. That together is an entity. Because that is a truth, we've come up with this amazing game. We said, oh, fantastic. So let's, let's play this out there. Let's pretend we're not one, but we are many. So there's me, all that exists, and then there's all that I am not, all that I'm existing separately from. Fabulous. And it's an illusion, sure, we're actually all one, but we're pretending, okay? And that gives us an opportunity to relate to each other as if we are many. Wow, and if we really make a lot of us, then we have plenty of opportunities to bump into each other and go, whoa, what happened here? <gasps> and feel something, and we get an experience of who we are. Amazing. Now that works only under one condition. We forget that we are one, okay? So we are agreeing, right, we are many, we're pretending we're not one, boom, suddenly we're in here, <gasps> look at this, I've got a body, and seemingly there's nothing between us here, in reality, we all know there's this, you know, density of matter, then it gets a bit looser, and then it starts here again, actually one and the same thing, but we restrict our senses not to sense this. And so it appears to us like, well, you're there, I'm here, this feels like solid. We know it's not solid, but it feels like it's solid. And if I bang my head against the table, God, this is solid. I have an experience because I relate myself to that table. Boy, it's painful. And then I can choose whether that was an authentic experience, self-experience, or whether I don't want to do that again because that's not really what I've come for. So that's actually the game we're playing. We have a body. And we have a mind. So we have a vehicle and we have a driver, the mind. And these two allow us to create things and events. Because that's all we can produce. Things and events. And those things give us experience. Okay, so we come from unity, we're one, and we're coming in to duality. Me and not me. The opposite of me. Light and darkness. So that I can experience, mis experience myself as light in the context of what I'm not. Ah, when I step into the darkness, I get a sense of who I truly am. I am that light. And with that reference point, an experiential reference point, I can go back into the light where there's only light, where I'm sitting in a sea of light, but I have this reference point inside. And I shall never forget. I know what it means to be light, even though I can't distinguish myself from all the light that's around me. But I know who I am. For I stepped into the darkness. Oh, I love this mic. <laughs> um, so we're coming in from the unity with a drive, with a need for self-expression and self-experience. And that's a collective, if you like, the all of us. The collective drive for self-experience. And as we enter duality, this turns into an individual drive for self-expression or self-experience, okay? And we have a body, we have a mind in duality, and these two things create the only two things that can be created, things and events. And those give us an experience. Now we have another dilemma. What's the dilemma now? We're here in duality, we have this, we're doing this. What's the big dilemma? 
Now we want to go back to the youth. No, not quite, because we don't, we, we've agreed that we've forgotten that exists. So we don't have that dilemma yet, okay? So we're coming in, we're thinking, oh, I, <laughs> what am I doing here? There are all these things around me, there's you, there's me. Now what? What are we doing? Why are we here? We've forgotten where we come from, we've forgotten what our motivation was to come in. So we need a satnav, we need a tom-tom that tells us what to do somehow, a guidance through this duality, because it only works if we don't constantly get a reminder of actually, you know, this is who you are, and the whole game doesn't work. So what is our tom-tom? We've created things and events, we have an experience, but who tells us that the experience is an authentic experience, as in that we've created with body-mind something purposefully that allows us to have the experience that we've come for, an experience of myself, not something. I mean, I can tie a piano to my cheeks and, and check that one out. It's an experience, but is this why I came? Not really, but who tells me that I, Huh? Jiva. Who? Jiva. Jiva. What do you mean by Jiva? The embodied soul. The embodied soul. Okay, but the embodied soul, that's who we are, that's right. And how does Jiva do it? Yes. yes. Because, as I said before, experience only is the only way for us to have an emotional response. It is the emotion that we feel, the feeling that we have as we experience. This is the direct feedback from here, whether the experience was authentic, meaning something that is self-expressive, or not authentic, something that doesn't express me and myself. So we all come in, all the myriads of beings that take a body, we incarnate, and we all come in with, I guess, a set of goals and aims to experience certain aspects of who we are in unity. So we all do our little job that then individually it contributes to the collective experience of who we are. And emotions are therefore, because they come from Jiva, because they come from there, from source, they're not what academia calls them, mm, soft data, and, oh, we we'll just mess stuff up. No, they are true, they are proportionate. They are proportionate and, uh, what's the word? Appropriate. Proportional and appropriate to the thing and event and to the experience that was made. And it will always be with the same experience, the same emotion that will come up. Because that comes from here. It doesn't come from our mind. And that's why I think it's really useful to make a distinction between emotions and mind. They come from different sources. You can trust your emotions. What you feel is real. The rest, who knows? But emotions can be triggered by the trauma. Like yeah. And trauma is an experience. And that's very important. The trauma is not the event. The event happens, and it may look outwardly very simple, but you never know what happens inside. The trauma is always the experience of a, in the case of traumatic experience, or what's labeled traumatic, significant emotional events, which I think is a more useful term because trauma is highly charged and labeled and connotative of bad da 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 No, a significant emotional event, which is what that is, is what triggers a particular experience. And then it depends what we make out of it. So first of all, what we feel about it, and then it depends on what is the action taken after that, and what is happening around that experience as it happens. When it happens when we are very small, and we don't have help with a big emotion, in the case of a traumatic experience, we may not know what to do with it. So our mind, which comes next, judges the emotion. Because we don't, you know, what are emotions? Okay, they're good emotions, they're bad emotions. Actually, no. Emotions are just a feedback from here. What's the word? Authentic experience or inauthentic experience, that's all. But that already is actually a function of the mind that already judges the feeling in some way, bad or good, okay? There are no good or there are no bad emotions, but our mind judges them to be. And based on this, we then make our belief systems, okay? And it's that that then creates our behavior. 
Now, depending on, in a traumatic experience, if there's support to deal with the emotion, if the emotion is allowed to be there, is contained, is explained, etc., by parents or people around us, we may draw appropriate, correct conclusions and values from that and create belief systems that are supportive for us to deal in future, should that happen again, or moving forward into our life to maybe do things which will stop from that happening again. Okay, that's the sequence. Can you see the important bit here? That's a sequence, and that sequence starts with emotion, experience, emotion, then comes the mind, and then comes the body. And that is what I referred to at the beginning. How do body, mind, and emotions work together? In a clinical context, and I would say in any context, it's this sequence. It never happens the other way around. But people come to us in the clinic at this level. So our job, I believe, as holistic practitioners, is to start to work our way back so that we understand how do they judge themselves, and based on the judgments and the values they are making, what might have happened that created that experience and that emotional response for them to create that sequence and seemingly to repeat that sequence again and again so that it materializes. So what's the purpose of disease if we define disease as something that lands on the body, a physical dilemma, a physical manifestation? The purpose is to help us to come back to heal something that's got stuck somewhere here. Because if we draw the incorrect conclusions about something and then put our behavior based on this, we will express ourselves inauthentically. And there's a point when it manifests physically as illness, disease, imbalance, whatever. So any disease is physically manifestation, even on a mental level, is a pointer to, ah, Sasha, have a look. There's something you're not understanding. You're, there's something you've accepted as fact, which in fact is not. It's a belief, it's an assumption, it's a mulya, it's a manyata you have. Start questioning it. And sometimes in life, or often in life, we are too absorbed. We are so stuck in what we believe to be reality that we need somebody else to look at this mess. That's why we go to practitioners. I can tell you all of this, but when I walk into my mess, okay, I need somebody else to help me to look at it. Because with all the knowledge I have, it doesn't help. I just see mess. Or clarity. I believe it is clarity, but actually it's mess. And I need somebody to point out that mess in me. Does that make sense? Okay, example for this, for instance, in the sense of it is really useful to have this sequence. There's nothing wrong with this, okay? That's the mechanics. When we're born, one of the first impulses we have is, oh, we need nourishment, okay? Because just before we were nine months in mommy's tummy, everything was done for us, beautiful, unity experience, okay? Suddenly, boom, we're out there, ah, help. And the first help we have that we need is, an experience of oh, unity again, because suddenly we're, we're on our own, we don't know this. Oh, I need quickly an experience of shelter, safety, trust again. Where do I get this? Mummy's boobs. <laughs> uh, something she still dearly loves. Okay? And whenever something happens that brings up strong emotions, that's the first place she goes to just, <sighs> and that's what babies do naturally, as they come out, uh, up to the boom, ah, uh, docked, and ah, uh, everything relaxes, back into unity. So the value, judgment that's made, that's made here is that's authentic, that's me, that's great, I experience safety, trust, shelter, that's what I've come for. Ah, uh, I want to feel good. So the value judgment is wonderful, great, and what's the belief system that could arise from that? Because babies tend to do this again and again, so they will generalize this, and I've heard this belief system announced many a times, money is the best. <laughs> Beautiful, because that helps the bonding, that helps a lot of development, that has a lot of evolution over the first years. When is this going to be a problem, though, that belief system? When that little person has started to marry, let's say a little boy still holds it, is getting married, has a wife, and still holds a belief system, mommy is the best. 
Ouch. <laughs> Belief system is still the same, but context is different. And now it's contradicting the context, and that is causing the problem. So it's the belief system itself is very valuable in a particular time frame. And it will cause a lot of collateral damage if it is not checked and updated. And we often forget that. Our culture doesn't allow us to authentically update and check and assess our belief systems, but it is mostly based on giving us belief systems and making us believe that they are checked and they're time honored and they're time proven and eat it, digest it, integrate it, shut up. Okay? So just as an example of the sequence. And if I think again our job is to find have methods that allow us to go back here to find out what actually happened that made somebody end up with a particular disease. Okay, so let me just give you, jump into clinical reality and just give you a few examples of what that might look like, okay? And it's not like for some person with a particular experience, that disease results, and for another person with the same experience and the same situation that arose from, a totally different disease. No, that's the beauty of it it will result in a very similar or same pathology because there's a logic to it. Because the pathology, the purpose of pathology is to remind me, look here, look there, that's where the issue is. You need to dig in there. You can eat as many herbs as you like and do prostrations in the morning and meditation and vinachari and all of this. Unless you look here, it's gonna manage things beautifully, but it's not gonna solve it. You're not gonna evolve, you're not gonna move on. You're likely to repeat it again. And all the methods you're using are likely to start working at some point. And then you go to the Chinese doctor and you go to this, uh, and you try and you try and you try, but you stay on a management level. You stay on this level, maybe on this level, but you've not gone to the level of the significant emotional event that may have triggered the whole sequence. So we're not working, therapeutically speaking, holistically, because we're not addressing all uh, levels. Lower back pain. Something that I see so much in my practice, and I'm sure you in your practice too, okay? Stress in the L3, L4, L5, S1 area, okay? In the absence of VAT, in the absence of rheumatoid or rheumatic problems, lower back pain. Where does this come from? Physics, okay? If I want to make that movement, if I want to make that step forward, there's an action, there's a force that goes this way. And if for me to do that without falling over, I need to have an equal force holding me here. Otherwise, I do this and I fall over. And in the same way that it is mechanical and physical and in physics, it's also in life. If I want to make a step forward into my life, meaning my future, the stuff that is ahead of me, I need to have my past in my back holding me to the degree that I want to make striding Steps ahead. And if I don't have that, if I haven't got my ancestor, who is my past? My ancestry, my family, my tribe, whatever you want to call it. If I don't have that in my back, holding my back to the degree that I need it for those steps forward, I will not be able to make those steps. Or whenever I make them, I'll wobble and probably fall flat on my bottom. And it's painful, because not only is it painful to hit my bottom, but it's also painful to be reminded that I don't have that support of my tribe each time again. And so what do people do? People often decide, oh, I've been doing this a few times, you know what? I'm not gonna make these big steps. I'm just gonna stay where I am. Actually, it's really comfortable, it's fine. I don't need to go there, it's all right. I'll stay here. And they don't move forward in their life. Other people may decide, actually, I really wanted to get there soon, but it's too painful to be reminded that there's a vacuum behind me. So I'll take small steps. Maybe I'll get there in three lives. Hey, so what? I'll get there eventually. You know, I have my belief systems and all of that. It's fine. But I don't want that pain. Pain avoidance is one of the causes, one of the main motivators for behavior. Some people say, you know what? F it. I'm going to do it anyway. I haven't got somebody here, but I'm going to take these big steps forward. I will fall a few times. I'll get myself up again. I'll do it on my own, and I'll get through that. And they make it happen. But by the time they made it happen, by the time they got there, without the support, L3, L4, S5, uh, 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 L5, 
five has one in that area. These vertebrae are screaming at them, saying, what on earth are you doing? We are made to, to protect, to support your physical body, but we're not here to support your emotional body, your ancestral body, your tribal body. We can't do this. And what happens? They buckle, they go, ooh. And what's the clinical presentation? Prolapse. Any prolapse in the lumbar area is a lack of support. That's the experience. Lack of support. Whatever the things or events that happened for that person, this is what we need to help them to find out. What happened that created the experience of lack of support? I'm yet to see someone with this clinical presentation that didn't have that. That didn't respond to my question when I sense this, when I read it in the pulse, or when I hear it from a symptom, you know, when they tell me the symptom. I'm yet to find the patient after those 20 years of practice who will not immediately respond, usually with a truth response, a cry, a sadness that comes up, or frustration that comes up, to the fact that they didn't have the support they needed. They may have had all the food, all the sweets, all the shelter, all of it, but there was one level of support that they didn't get, or maybe several, never ever had. And they've been struggling with this all their lives, because that vacuum is always there. And the question I ask is, and I tend to ask those kind of questions out of the blue, seemingly completely out of context, because that goes really deep and triggers the subconscious mind where those things are stored. Tell me about support in your life. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then just ask the same question in the same tone, not changing anything, no explanation. Tell me about support in your life. This goes deep. But don't say a word, just look at them. Not looking for something, looking at. Just being present. And trust that you just put something over there which just percolates through. And when they're ready, it will come. Most of the time, it comes like that. Because they've been waiting for a lifetime of this to be rectified. And they've been going from person to person to find someone who finally understands because they don't understand. It's magical when that happens. This is when I have the experience of working holistically, understanding holistically. I don't know what happened. I don't need to know. We don't need to know. But understanding what the experience has tells us, oh, this is the sequence that probably happened. Now we know why they are constantly working like, like mad hatters. Because they need to do it all on their own, because they haven't had somebody. Suddenly they understand why, etc., etc. And it's never too late to create that support. They didn't have it back then, and they can't create it back then, but they can create it now. But somehow there's a belief system lodged since then that helped them survive that I have to do it on my own. And in fact, they're now in a situation in their lives where they don't have to do it on their own because there is support available. But if I have learned and adopted a belief system that I can't trust, I can't rely on anyone, I will not seek support. And even if it is offered, I will not take it. So to help people to break that chain will allow them to finally take the support, relax, strengthen their back, and achieve the things in their lives with ease rather than incredible hardship and pain. Make sense? Mm. Yeah. Urinary tract infections. What, if, what about this? What's the theme? What's the experience behind urinary tract infections? What do animals do, some animals, to mark their territory? Ah! The bladder is the organ that tells us whether somebody's ability to draw their boundaries is appropriate, is healthy, or not. And so, a, a urinary tract infection shows that my bladder isn't working optimally. It gets easily infected. There's a carvigunia, there's a weakness in that area. And that weakness has been created by an experience of boundary crossing in an intimate area. This could be a physical boundary crossing, it could be a sexual boundary crossing, it could be a verbal boundary crossing, it could be a psychological or emotional, it doesn't matter. As long as it is an intimate boundary crossing, and it was a significant emotional event, meaning 
it was an event where I didn't have the support to make sense of what was happening, and in this context, there was nobody to protect my boundaries for me at that time. I'm very likely to go to get bladder issues later, and particularly urinary tract infections. Now, why is it that women have more, how many times? 20 minutes, I've already spoken four minutes, goodness me. Why is it that women have more urinary tract infections than men? It's not because anatomy, it's not because they have a shorter urethra. No, no mother nature wouldn't do this to women, okay? It's because in our culture and on the globe for centuries, for millennia, women's boundaries have been far more crossed than males' boundaries. It's just a fact of life. Naturally, it will be women who have more urinary tract infections. What a boundary, what a, you know, one may think of rape, sexual boundary crossing, physical, in the first instance hearing what I've just said. But it doesn't need to be this. It could be, Mama talking with daughter about the problems she has with daddy and also problems in bed. Big boundary crossing. I had a patient where that was the case, okay? That's a massive boundary, uh, boundary crossing. And it showed when this 18 year old had sex with her boyfriend and had nothing to do with the boyfriend, but because of the intimacy that happened and the boundary crossing in the intimate area, sexual context that mum was creating, uh, that each time she had physical sexual contact with her boyfriend, that cellular memory was triggered, okay, boom, and she would get an infection. Um, parents saying to children, you cannot come into our bedroom without knocking on the door parents allow themselves to go into the teenager's bedroom unannounced anytime. Ouch, big boundary crossing. Not okay. Uh, I had a patient who, a colleague actually, um, who said when she was 11, she, her breasts were growing and her grandfather would sort of always say, ooh, mm, yummy. Your future boyfriends will have a lot of fun. Stuff like that. Okay? He never touched but that's enough. But who was this woman truly angry with? Who did she have a real issue with? Not with grandfather, with mum, who stood next to that and didn't say a word. Because she had a dynamic with daddy running and she was not allowed to speak. She learned from daddy that women have to suffer that. The world is such that man can do this and women have to just allow it. And that's exactly because she hadn't dealt with it. She put that package onto her daughter. No word was uttered. It's not necessary. It's the behavior. It's the not doing that's enough for this nonsense to be perpetrated down the line through generations again and again. And there she was, a woman who was studying Ayurveda, highly intelligent, but learning as an 11 year old, that's what women do. I look at mum, she stands there, Grandfather saying it, it's nothing you can do. You just shut up and let it happen. And so she didn't learn what it means to say no, because she was not shown by mum, who should have at that moment said, oi, dead, no. Which part of no don't you understand? It didn't happen. And so she doesn't know where to put her no. And one is why later in life, when she's a therapist, patients keep pinching her bottom during the treatment. It's as if she has written on her forehead subconsciously, I don't know where my boundaries are. And guess who is going to be the perpetrator in that scenario, the one, the patient on the couch, somebody <coughs> whose boundaries were also crossed. That's not an excuse, but that's an explanation because they also don't know where their boundaries are. And they read, ah, there's another one who doesn't know what I don't know. And so they flip between perpetrator and victim all the time. And that woman did a clever thing when she chose a partner, she chose a man who will never ever cross her boundaries, who is so soft, meaning he is so not in his masculinity, he is so not in his man, that he will never dare do any boundary crossing. And that worked for nine years beautifully. She felt safe, great. But after nine years, she was so angry because she was not met as a woman in her marriage. 
and marriage was a disaster in that sense. And it ended right there. When she broke that cycle, when she became aware of what this was about, when she realized why her urinary tract infections were pointing at this. And she, she broke off that relationship. And the next man, when she stepped into her power, when she resolved this issue with mum, broke that line, that package that was passed on and said, I'm not going to perpetrate this down my line. My children will not have this. This will die with me. When she did that and announced this through process work, guess what happened? She found a man who was a mountaineer, somebody who was kidnapped once in Africa and led a group of 30 Austrians through three months of not knowing whether they were going to die in the next moment. That guy was 21 at the time, but he was so in his man. He was such a masculine, such an incarnation of masculinity from nature, from being in the mountains, from leading groups through treacherous mountain paths, that he was able to hold 30 people alive through three months of such an incredible, intense uh, you know, challenge, physically, mentally, emotionally but they all survived, they were all rescued, and it's down to this guy, primarily. That was the next man she chose, because she can trust that man. So this man, who is in his masculinity, will not challenge, let alone cross a boundary. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <laughs> I, I, I could speak on about different diseases, but I just don't want to just rattle it off, just want to leave a bit of time. I was going to ask you to rattle it. Wow. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm coming back to that. <laughs> so I'm curious, I, I love how you've taken examples of lower back pain and UTIs and things like that. I'm curious how... They usually how... work really well. What's that? They usually work really yeah, well. They yeah. resonate a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm experiencing this a lot with my clients, that things are just, you know, coming out. And I'm kind of working with... Rasa Sadhana as well, so the Indian philosophy of the, you know, the nine emotions. And I'm just curious how you feel about those using, say, the correlation with you know, joy, wonder, and anger with pitta or fire, right? <coughs> Trying to cultivate the positive joy, wonder aspects of the, of the fire-related emotions to balance you know, anger and obviously... Say, you know, I'm curious how you then huge treat. topic, huge topic. I know it's huge, yeah. This is exactly what in my seminars or in our seminars, my wife and I, what we go into right. in much more detail and right. overlay Jungian philosophy, modern understanding of emotions yeah. and core, particularly core emotions, which are neither good nor bad. They have a function. Okay, anger, why does anger come up when somebody crosses my boundaries? Because anger is the emotion that has that one function to tell me somebody's crossed my boundary or somebody's challenged my boundary. And it invites me to draw my boundaries more clearer. That's it. But anger has such a bad rap in our society. And it is equaled with uh, violence. Now, violence is an action. That's not an emotion. That's an inappropriate expression, acting expression of an emotion. It's totally different. But because we haven't got culturally, we are not allowed, particularly man, to express our anger and to show our anger, we've learned to put it in shadow, we put it behind us. It's not, it, we deny, we repress. But if we reply that, uh, uh, deny that signal, yeah. we have no access to our boundary drawing capacity. Look at what happens out there in life. Nobody knows where somebody's boundary starts. Everybody's walking all over each other. Anger is the pathway to this. So we could speak yeah, for, for hours about this, but a very useful question. Okay. But we'll Emotions see. are core for understanding how people operate and how they create disease and imbalance. And you, and you just to, to the last of the question, you do, and you obviously do workshops in this, you do use the elements, and in the, in the same way that we look at the doshas, do you, do you bring those in to treat them? To you know, When you go back to this moment when... Emotions don't need to be treated. Emotions arise when I have an experience. You cannot, you, there's nothing, it's a so signal. Just, it's a signal, okay, it's an so alarm that goes on and on. What needs treating is my response and my values yeah. and my belief systems and my behavior around them. Do I allow them or not? Yeah. Where do I put the handbrake? Yeah, okay. Are the belief systems that I hold belief systems that work for me, or are they literally BS? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Any other questions? Okay, cancer. What's cancer about? Somebody was speaking about it yesterday. I forgot who it was. I was already sort of describing something very much in line with how we understand cancer. Or Dr. Pallad explains it very, very similarly. It's an identity crisis. Okay? Cancer is an expression of an identity crisis. And when you look at a cellular level, with all these things, you just need to look at what the body does. That gives you a very clear clue what's actually happened or what the experience is. What the issue is probably is the thing or the event that has happened that caused that manifestation. Boundary crossing is bladder. Because it's a territorial organ. Okay, that's the link. Lower back. Okay, there's a, there's a, literally a physical uh, reason for that. Cancer cells themselves are not bad, but they've lost the connection with with buddhi, with ojas, with tejas, with pran. They don't know what they are. They don't know who they are anymore in the context of the overall organism. So they do something. They do what they're good at. Multiply. Great. And then it gets more and more and more. But they have forgotten the information that actually they should only multiply in this way or that way. And for that purpose, they, don't. they themselves are not toxic, but the amount, zero or ten? <laughs> they have forgotten what that purpose is. And so they do something rather than doing what their job is in the context of me so that I can recognize myself in the morning when I look in the mirror. And so they do something that's outside their purpose and their identity. And then we see broadly two categories of people who choose cancer or who produce cancer. There are two motivations to do this. One is as a gateway, as a way of waking up, as a way of realizing, oh my God, what am I doing? What have I used my body and my mind for to create what kind of experiences, as in things and events in my life that create experiences that are actually not authentic, that are not who I am? And what do I need to change in the way I use my body and my mind to create authentic experiences? And sometimes a cancer diagnosis is really useful to shock somebody into gear and go like, whoa, hang on a minute, I need to get back on my path. I need to follow my dharma. I've been following somebody's dharma, but not mine. Or people choose cancer as an exit strategy. I'm done. I'm out of here. Okay? We're, we're moving back here. We're taking another body. We're done with this one. And there are particular cancers that work really well for exit strategy, pancreas, etc. And there are cancers that work really well because they're very amenable to treatment for the gateway. And the beauty is, when I understood that as a patient, when I understand that, oh, it's an identity crisis, I need to look what I need to change, it doesn't really matter whether I use Ayurveda, whether I use Chinese medicine, whether I use Gerson, whether I use modern medicine, chemotherapy, or nothing, it's probably going to work out. And if I have the exit strategy cancer, it doesn't really matter what I do. It's going to work out, meaning I'm going to take myself out of this life. It's going to happen one way or the other. Whether I take this or that, it doesn't matter. Okay. Once, uh, once you take your patient back to this, I mean, you work your, your way they back. They take themselves back. But yeah, facilitating yeah. that process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so once they understand, okay, they, they know this is what yeah. happened, that's the experience that caused it, what then? What then? Something shifts already, something happens. That's an experience themselves. And a pathway opens up. Or they discover parts of themselves. They rediscover parts of themselves which they have repressed, denied. That opens up a whole plethora of, of possibilities for them. And then it's up to them. It purely... What is our job to facilitate, not take them down that road? We need to check, are they ready to do this? And maybe they're not. Maybe they need to do 100 rounds of the same nonsense again and again until they're ready. And who knows, they walked into our clinic when they were at round 67. Hey, we've done 67 for them. They didn't get what they wanted, but it wasn't their time. And maybe we don't know, but it's, it's okay. We've done all we could. And maybe they need another 33 until they break through this and make the real change in life that they were after already from the beginning. We don't need to know. We need to follow them in that process, not drive that process. You try to drive that process, you're not going to be very successful in practice after a while. People sniff that out very quickly. 
and they will come and they will knock on your door, whether you do Ayurveda or not, whether they understand Ayurveda or not, they'll come to your door because they know from others. They hear it, they feel it. Their whole side, inside, tells them, she will understand me. She will help me. She's got the right tools. I don't care what the tools are, but it's not happening here. It's happening here. And they'll find their way to you. And you can trust that process as a practitioner too. If people knock on your door, you'll be able to help them. Trust that. Even if you don't know how, just be with them. And that's a skill in itself. Premature ejaculation. I know there are plenty of women in the room, but you know, you may have been at the receiving end of this session. <laughs> What has this got to do? This, this premature ejaculation is an is a experience or not experience of masculinity for men. Not being in their power, not having been introduced into their true core power as a man. They have not made the transition from boy to man. Now, that would not have happened in any of our ancient cultures because that is such an important ritual for both men and women. Girls need to become women, and there are clear rituals, there are symbolic journeys, there are thresholds they need to cross. And these are thresholds that need that, 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 that require them to step out of their comfort zone, that require them to dig archetypally so deep inside to liberate a potential, a power to manifest in this life with this body to a degree that they can't just, oh, yeah, just, just do it just like that. Or, you know, go to religious confirmation and just get a bunch of flour and a congratulation or whatever is done. These are all rituals that are the sad remain reminders or sad leftovers of those uh, rituals in the past that have the power, the wisdom, and the love, and the understanding of society will only be sustainable if we do these things behind them. Those rituals that are done today in our modern society, whether in communist societies or religious societies, they cannot do this. And so a lot of men are just man by body, but not man, how, as in how they activate, how they live their bodies. And the same is true for women if they have, didn't have that initiation. And without that internal initiation, in some way, there is a lack of strength, a lack of capacity, a lack of, not manliness, that's um, stamina. And it becomes, why does it show up as premature ejaculation? If I am with my power equal, my partner, if I'm with my life partner, who I am eye to eye with, if I'm together with this person in an intimate way, if I commune with that person physically, if I enter her, my power equal, and I step into her temple, and I arrive inside of her, but she may be in her power, and I am not. Look. That moment, I step in. The universe has to give me a feedback on where I am. And it gives me a proportionate, appropriate, true, and objective feedback. Over. You will not go high. You will not have an orgasmic feeling with this woman because you're not at that level. You can't have that. You need to match, but you haven't done your work yet, mate. Sorry. Boop. Game over. Start again. Does that make sense? You can give all the herbs you like to that kind of man. It's not going to make a difference. That person, that man, needs to do something on a totally different level. And just psychological, forget, it's an experience. Something needs to happen. That man needs to be, in some way, initiated. The power, it's all there, it's potential. It's already all there, but it hasn't been activated. There needs to be a process that switches the green light on. Otherwise, this man will experience themselves, you know, in, in a Ferrari of a body, standing at the light, red light, and nobody ever switches it on green. You know how frustrating that is for men? Because nobody ever showed them what it means to drive this car. And so they keep on driving this beautiful machine, like a Vauxhall or whatever. <laughs> really deeply, deeply, deeply frustrating, both for the men and the women. Because what do women do when they are together with men in this situation? They often take on a lot of the masculine features. 
they need to hold that in the partnership. Women will step up and take on that. They will, they will fill the, the gap at the expense of exploring and experiencing and living their own femininity, which is what their job is. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs>